Philanthropology and the Good Road is brought to you by AMD. Advanced Micro Devices. You want to know what it was like going to war, Max Lowe? Is that what you're asking me now? It was intense. It was real. It was like snapping into a Slim Jim. It was like that big <laughs> Kool-Aid guy running through your door. And then you're like, Kool-Aid guy, I'm snapping into a Slim Jim and I'm about to kick your ass. And there's Kool-Aid everywhere, man. And glass and everything. And then Randy Savage is like, snap into a Slim Jim. And I'm like, F you, Randy. Bam, bam, bam. Blood and guts are everywhere. And the Iraqis are crying and babies are crying. And I'm like, F girl, America. <laughs> I think that's probably inappropriate. So that was our good friend Stacy Barrett giving a raw, rare, honest description of what it's really like to be in combat. Yeah, if you think you know Stacy from that short clip, keep listening because he's an interesting character who's dedicated his life to helping others. He's got a, it's a complex character. I mean, he's one of the kindest, nicest, most intelligent people you will ever meet. And life for him changed dramatically after combat. So stick around to hear his story. Philanthropology is the companion piece to our TV show on public television called The Good Road. I'm Earl Bridges. And I'm Craig Martin and we capture stories of mercenaries, missionaries, and misfits. It's a raw look at the messy and complicated business of global philanthropy. And Craig and I sit off around the world to places where people are doing good. It's Batman, not Superman. Check out The Good Road on your local PBS station starting in April. Stacy Bear is a six foot seven Viking warrior, yeah. but there's so much more to Stacy that we decided to bring him onto the show and let him tell his story. It's great. So, um, and later in the podcast, we'll talk to Dave and Karen Eubank of the organization Free Burma Rangers. Karen and Dave Eubank and kids Saheli, Suzanne, and Peter rescue civilians caught in the middle of conflict on the front lines of major war. Now, you won't want to miss Karen's insight of what it's like to do good in the midst of a war in places like Syria and Myanmar, aka Burma. And as always, make sure to listen to the end for our road trip segment. First stop, Stacy Bear. At the beginning of each new year, we all think about the goals we have for ourselves. One of my goals this year is to learn and expand my knowledge of our world and the people in it. I'm with you, Earl. And fortunately, we can accomplish that goal through a fantastic resource, The Great Courses Plus. It's an online learning service which offers thousands of lectures from top experts covering everything from human behavior to American history, from travel photography to cooking, and the list goes on. Yeah, and so one course that Earl and I definitely recommend is Understanding the Mysteries of Human Behavior. This course asks thought-provoking questions about the contradictions of human behavior, analyzes current theories in psychology, neuroscience, and other behavioral sciences. They're offering our listeners an amazing deal. Three months of unlimited access for just $30. That's only $10 a month. Get all the details at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash thegoodroad. Thegreatcoursesplus.com slash thegoodroad. So, Stacy, you're joining us. Thank you so much for being on our podcast. We're excited to have you. Um, and this particular podcast is a little interesting because we were, will later in the podcast be talking to somebody in a war zone. You're in a remote part of Utah, as I understand. So we have a little bit of technology challenges, but that's kind of the fun of the podcast. Well, Stacy, I mean, it's been a pleasure. I mean, we got to meet you, I guess, a couple of years ago for the first time. You were doing Adventure Not War at that point. I think you were releasing the film into the film festival uh, world. And it's been fun just following you on Instagram. We'll put some you know, links up to your activities uh, on our social media as well. But if you don't mind, just tell the listeners... What is your background? Why you joined the Army? How'd you end up in the Army? So I, I joined the Army. I got my commission out of the University of Mississippi in the year 2000. And, you know, it was a very different world, right? And so Kosovo was the big concern for some deployment. And I ended up getting stationed in Germany. And I know that on September 9th, 2001, I finished a book called An Unexpected Light in a Garden about Jason Elliott's travels through Afghanistan. I remember thinking, oh, I can't wait. I'm going to go next summer. I'm going to go backpack through Afghanistan. Jason Elliott did it. I can do it too. Uh, and then 9-11 happened, and I thought, okay, certainly I'm going to go to Afghanistan. And my unit was a strategic intelligence unit, so we didn't deploy as a unit, and I couldn't find a way to get over there. And then in 2003, we invade Iraq, and I got attached to a unit that was supposed to go into Iraq through Turkey. The Turks decided they didn't want that to happen, so I didn't go to Iraq. And ultimately, I went to Bosnia in 2003 and 2004, 
And I came out of Bosnia and Army and I just had wildly different ideas about what my, the future of my career should look like. And so I actually left the Army and I went and did explosive ordnance disposal work. And so I went to Baghdad in 2006 and I got to Baghdad right before the surge. And I spent the last six, seven months out on the streets of Baghdad almost every day with my team trying to figure out how to grow civil engagement and support you know, reconstruction of Baghdad after the conflict. Uh, we got blown up, we got shot at, uh, but for the most part, I was operating in a daytime environment. And kind of one of the very first images that really stuck with me in a negative way, uh, we were out on patrol. This is why I was still doing a lot of staff work. And I remember seeing these two dogs uh, up on a little hillside and they were, they looked so happy and they were eating. And what they were eating, they were eating the neck out of a man who had been, murdered and oh, left gosh. under rubbish. And for years, if anybody touched my neck, I had this very real sensation that it was one of those dogs trying to get at my neck. Mm. And there was also, uh, while I was on base, there was an EOD unit that was next door to us, and there was an accident. One of the individuals was killed immediately, and the other individual had his, you know, the, the middle portion of his body torn open, and I was the first responder there. And so those two things, as well as, you know, seeing Iraqis get killed, um, seeing Iraqi combat combatants getting killed, um, all kind of stuck with me in a way more so than us getting shot at or me getting shot at or me getting blown up. Um, and that's one of the things for years I really struggled with was why do I feel so bad? Because wow. I discounted my experiences. I was like, I haven't been through enough. So tell us about that transition back to the United States. Yeah, the, the transition was tough. One of the things when I came home, I felt like I had missed out on so much of life. And I, I wanted to suck the marrow out of life. So I threw myself at life. Or I thought I threw myself at life. And I'm a big guy. I was about 300 pounds when I left Iraq. I wasn't very fat. And I was able to ingest an insane amount of alcohol and drugs. And that was who I became in many ways. And I lived kind of this double life where, yeah, I was a hard party and graduate student, but I was also relatively healthy and whatever. But like, eventually you got to go to bed and there's a pill for that. And eventually you got to wake back up and there's a pill or a powder for that. And eventually you got to party again and there's a drink for that. I felt guilty the day I left Iraq for leaving Iraq. I felt guilty that I got to live and other people didn't live. I felt, you know, what did I have to live for? I didn't have a wife. I didn't have kids. I didn't have a community that I... I wanted to either go back in the army or just end it all, you know, and it, I didn't necessarily think of it as uh, death by suicide as much as I thought of it as just poof being gone. And uh, I called my friend Chuck, who I had served with in Baghdad. And long story short, he got me out rock climbing. And that is what really changed my life and put me on a pretty drastically different pathway any of the paths I thought I would head down. Yeah, when Stacy, when you just talked about that transition, I mean, it was quick to say you started to struggle and think about ending it all, and then next thing you know, you're in the suburbs of uh, Salt Lake City, uh, experiencing outdoor life. But that was a dark period. I can I can tell hmm. between those two things, and you had disclosed some things in the past about how dark that was. Yeah, I mean, it, that's a 13 year journey, right? And so it is easy now to be like, "Yep," and then I did this, and now I'm here. And I think it also discounts the amount of effort and time and struggle and also the fact that, like, there's still really dark moments. But what climbing did for me was it pulled me into the moment and it gave me a sense of purpose. And for a long time, I said, well, you know, the best part about climbing was that it replicated the best parts of military service, right? It was a physical challenge. There was camaraderie. Um, there, there is that sense of purpose. There's physicality. And I began to piece all that together. And over time, I began to realize that what makes military service so great is that it takes a shadow of what we can achieve and feel in the outdoors. But there's always going to be a darkness there because at the end of the day, I don't think we're supposed to be shooting at each other. I think if someone's trying to grapple with how do I become sober or yeah, you know, overcome that? Out of it. Is it better on the other side? For, for me, it is. I mean, I didn't climb and then, you know, quit doing drugs and quit drinking and then my life was, you know, hmm. roses and lilacs. It took about until Memorial Day 2011 is when I really 
consciously began a pathway of recovery to, to, to engage with my, my use and substance abuse. And for me, what it was to, to start that journey of recovery was I needed to live for something else. So one of the things that inspires us so much about your full story is, yes, the dark parts are sad, but in your life, then you started to kind of put your energies towards this organization you started and talk a little bit about that part, that transition and the the joy that kind of comes from helping others. Yeah, describe the whole thing, the adventure, not war. It feels like you were running towards something or crafting towards something, but what is that? You know, I'm living with these negative dark, heavy narratives with some light and some positivity, but around places like Iraq and Angola and fear and guilt that I never made it to Afghanistan. So I decided I was going to start going back to these places, but experiencing them through the outdoors, experiencing them as a climber, as a skier, right, as a mountaineer. And so how that all ended up happening is I was talking to my partner, my wife about it, my partner, and she was like, that sounds really cool. When are you going to do it? And I got this invitation from my buddy Tim McGaw at Telluride Adaptive Sports to go to Chile and help out. Mackenzie and I talked about it, and she was like, that sounds great. I'd totally love to go, but when are you going to start this, like, make adventure and out war thing? And I was like, <laughs> you're right. And so I called up my buddy Chris and my buddy Pietro, who I'd served with in Bosnia. Pietro was part of the Italian Carabinieri. Chris was in the U.S. Air Force. And I said, hey, guys, let's go to Bosnia and hike around. And we'll, we'll write a little blog and we'll take some photos and it'll be cool for our friends and our family to see us going back to these places. My wife was pregnant with our daughter Wilder at the time. Wilder was born in 2016 and a couple months into Wilder uh, hanging out with us, Mackenzie said, you know, when are you going to go to Iraq? Well, probably when Wilder's in high school. And she said, well, I think you need to live the kind of life that you want your daughter to live. And so if this is really important to you, you need to figure out a way to go back earlier. So I thought to myself, you know, wow, this is a really profound moment. You know, my wife really supports me and she wants me to do this. And then she swears she didn't say this, but she, she did follow this up with, um, well, yeah, and if you go now and something happens, then I can get remarried. <laughs> you know, the difference. So in 2017, uh, myself and uh, two other veterans, Matthew Griffin, who runs Combat Foot Flops, and Robin Brown, who's the head of economic development for Grand Junction in Western Colorado, we strapped skis on with an amazing cadre of brand partnerships and Max Lowe, who's an incredible filmmaker and a good friend, and Max Fisher, who uh, is also a good friend and incredible filmmaker. The five of us headed over to Iraq in 2017. We landed in Erbil the same day that U.S. forces launched the offensive to drive ISIS out of Mosul, uh, U.S.-backed forces, Iraqi forces. And we went and were able to ski the first recorded ski ascent and descent of the highest mountain full in Iraq, Mount Halgird, you know, next to meeting my wife and meeting my daughter. It's the coolest thing I've ever done. But then in 2019, thanks to a, a gift from God guy I served with in Iraq, his fiance, his family foundation heard about what we were doing and they gave us enough resources to go over. And we spent about three weeks in Bamiyan, Afghanistan in, in 2019 skiing and following around the ski community there. And we're now in post-production. I think it's a great follow-up to the film we made in Iraq, which was really focused on myself and the veteran experience. And now we're really telling the story of what it's like to live in a place like Afghanistan and doing our best as we can to show that through the lens of the Afghan skiers who live there. From my vantage point, I mean, it literally in moments just brought me to tears knowing your background and then seeing the way you lovingly deal with the various topics of poverty and struggle and even moments when you're showing this very conservative islamic kind of fundamentalist group of people i was like if we ever get past all the conflict in the world it's going to come through people like you who've decided to personalize these things you know these the folks in, in Bamiyan are just like us, knowing you have more in common than you have as differences. I think that is so true in the United States as well, right? Right. And you go out to Afghanistan and you ski with these guys, and they're just like the people you ski with at home. You mm -hmm. know? I mean, they're the same hijinks, the same jokes. One of the filmmakers that was with us was so worried about being left behind in a village and kidnapped and beheaded, right? And fair enough. 
All right, that's all you hear about Afghanistan. That's a reason, reasonable. And we're like day one with this driver, and he doesn't speak any English. We don't speak Farsi, and then gets out to film something, and the driver looks at us, starts laughing, and drives off. Oh my right? god. <laughs> He hasn't heard about Jason Spear at all. He doesn't know about it. He just thinks, this is going to be funny. I'm going to pretend to leave this guy. (laughs) And he just drives off laughing, right? I mean, hysterically laughing. How many times have we done that to our friends just to be idiots, just to be silly, right? And here's this guy doing it, and he has no idea what sort of trauma he's sitting on. And then we tell him, and he just laughs more, right? I mean, And so this is a guy who, like, we spend three weeks with, you know, and we get to know him, and he brings his kid out, and we go to his house. And, I mean, and you just, you form these relationships over this shared experience of joy in the mountains or joy, you know, you can find joy anywhere. I mean, there's not that much difference. Mm. I think people want these stories. I think people want to know that life can be hard and beautiful and people want to feel connected to the world and that they can have some agency. And I think that's the same thing coming home from the military, right? Part of the reason coming home from the military was so hard is I didn't feel like I had agency. I didn't feel like I was in dignified work. I didn't feel like people really wanted to know what I could do. They only wanted to know who I was and they wanted to put me on a pedestal. And there's not a lot of room for other people on a pedestal, and it's hard to get down from a pedestal. So this is my shout-out. Take a look at the AdventureNotWar.com site and see some of the projects that Stacy's involved in. They're inspiring. And if you love it, figure out a way to reach out to Stacy and help fund some of this stuff. And I, and I would say, too, that after watching the first cut of the film, you actually are doing something that really could make a difference in our relationships with people, but you know, it requires people to get behind you as well. And we've never met you in person, but I feel like you're a brother, yeah. you know, in, in the battle, pun intended, uh, that we're all in. Right. Oh, and I'm, I'm not sure I want to meet you in person. If you <laughs> I mean, when I was leaving Iraq, one of the or neighborhood council members you were talking to, he comes up to me and he goes, you know, the bad people, when they came, they told us that American soldiers ate babies for breakfast. And we said, that's crazy. That never happens. And then we met you. And we're like, this is the one who eats the baby. <laughs> and he wasn't joking. Stuff like that, though, that really breaks things down. And even in Afghanistan, you know, I mean, I don't think of myself as a six foot seven, 250 pound white guy. I just think of myself as me, you know. Yeah. And uh, I love to hug and high five and laugh and joke around. But I've got, I try to be fairly aware that I have a pretty solid resting angry face, <laughs> but I'm not a very angry person these days. Well, Stacy, thank you so much for being on the podcast. I've been chomping at the bit to do this one and um, thank you for taking the time with us. Yeah, we'll see you down the road somewhere. We're going to do something amazing with you. Whatever, whatever crazy stuff you've got up your sleeve, we're all in. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Philanthropology is brought to you by First Republic. Since 1985, First Republic has had just one goal, deliver extraordinary service that always goes beyond client expectations. Because no two clients are alike, First Republic designs financial solutions for individuals and businesses that are customized to help meet your needs and goals. Reach out today and you'll be connected with a dedicated banker who will be your primary point of contact throughout your relationship with the bank. You can call, or email your banker at any time for advice or to get help with whatever arises. Because they understand your total financial picture, your banker can recommend the services and products that are best suited to you or your business. And they're committed to staying objective, so it's always about what makes sense for you at every stage and not about what's most profitable. If you're ready to discover how a personalized approach to banking can make a meaningful difference in your personal and business outcomes, visit firstrepublic.com to learn more. Member FDIC. So Earl and I grew up in Bangkok and went to the International School of Bangkok, also known as ISB. And one of our ISB alum and fellow missionary kid, Dave Eubank, started an organization a couple of decades ago called the Free Burma Rangers. Yeah, it's a really interesting organization that was just featured in a documentary that was screened in theaters across the U.S. Craig and I had the privilege of being executive producers on that film by the same name of the organization, Free Burma Rangers. Yeah, if you were able to see the film, you would know that Dave Eubank is an amazing person and a great communicator. 
His wife, who serves alongside him in battle zones, Karen, is equally articulate and interesting. Yeah, Karen and Dave live this life of extreme risk in extreme environments, and they live that life with their three kids. So we thought it'd be interesting to talk to Karen and get her perspective on what it's like to help others in the midst of war while doing your daily routines of normal life. I think any interview with Dave and Karen Eubank has to start with two questions, um, and you can reveal as much as you want to. First of all, where are you and are you safe? Well, we are in Iraq. We're in Erbil, northern Iraq, which is actually Kurdistan. We just crossed back from Syria and we are embarrassed to admit that we're really safe. Yeah, I think your version of safe and our version of safe sometimes are not congruent. <laughs> so we'll we'll be the we'll be the judge of whether or not you guys are safe. Well, I was born in Texas and my parents were missionaries to Thailand, so when I was nine months old, I went with them and grew up there and then got a commission uh, in the Army as an ROTC cadet, went to Texas A&M, spent 10 years in the military in the infantry down in Panama, then 2nd Range Battalion as a platoon leader, and then as a A-team or detachment commander in Special Forces and got out as a major. In the middle of all that, met Karen we met and were, Dave was at Fuller, and I was a teacher, and he blended his military history with a missionary heart and responded to a call to the Wa people in Burma. And I responded to the call that said, will you marry me? And we went off to the Wa for a year on a few short-term trips until the situation in Burma escalated so that so many refugees came across that they asked for help and not only to refugees, but to families displaced inside the conflict zones inside Burma. And all of a sudden that military history and missionary heart was joined when people said, come to our villages. They're too dangerous, too far to get to. Nobody wants to go there and encourage us and pray with us. And Dave said, yes, I want to go. Karen, one of the scenes in the movie in the very beginning was the idyllic wedding scene of you guys on a beach in Malibu. And when we all think about life and getting started, that feels like you got, you know, sold a bill of goods on the beach. <laughs> Did you know what you get into? I, I hoped that I would be able to fulfill the role that I saw before me. God said, I have a rich life for you and I'll take care of you. And this was the strongest man of God I'd ever met and amazing adventure. He, doesn't, he does not get out much. Yeah, what a blessing. Awesome. And we were married in Malibu and then went to Thailand and then up into Burma in 1993. So that was an invitation from people in Burma. And that grew into the Free Burma Rangers, our relief organization, giving help, hope and love and getting the news out in what is now a 70-year conflict in Burma with millions displaced, over a million internally displaced and millions more have fled to neighboring countries. And the war goes on to this day. So we've got nine teams working in Burma. These are small five-person teams moving mostly on foot in the mountains to help people under attack by the Burma army. And then in 2014, we were invited to Sudan. So we went there and trained teams in the Nuba Mountains of Sudan. So we had to go to South Sudan, then infiltrate across into Sudan proper, where the Nubans were under attack. We were bombed every single day there. And we went as a family. My, all the kids have grown up doing this. And I remembered when we crossed the border with the SPLA, the Sudanese People Liberation Army, my daughter Suzanne said, Daddy, we're not just a family, we're a team. And the Nubans said, oh, you brought your family. You must not want anything from us. We can trust you. In fact, I said, any land you want, you can have. Your family is our family. And when I went with Pete later in 2015, we were invited to help the Kurds when ISIS was starting their attacks. Pete and I went and they said, you brought your son, your most precious thing. We give you our most precious thing, our country. Same with the Iraqis. Oh, you brought your kids. You must think Americans are just as valuable as Iraqis. You must think we're all the same. We trust you. You can go anywhere you want. And you follow the same God we do. That's how we you know, got involved in Burma and in Sudan and then Kurdistan. And in the middle of our work in Kurdistan, which is up on Sinjar Mountain where the Yazidis were, as well as the Bashika front line near Erbil, 
in the middle of that, we were invited to go to Syria. And so in between different actions that were going on in 2015 and 16, we went numerous times to Syria to help there. And at that time, ISIS controlled most of eastern Syria and a good part of western Syria. So we were very limited where we could go. But we made friends, were able to help a little. And then when the big offensive against ISIS happened, which was 2016 in October, November, we were part of that, first with the Kurds, and then later invited to work with the Iraqi army in the Battle of Mosul because the, the NGOs had a lot of supplies, but their, their rules prohibited them from going into the direct fighting. And many families would not leave the areas of fighting because they were afraid their homes would be looted or they'd be arrested as ISIS sympathizers or killed. They wouldn't leave. So they were hunkered down in their basements and houses with no food. Seven of the first 10 food deliveries we did was under direct fire of ISIS. You'd drive seven ton trucks up with food. They'd be shooting at them, bullets pinging off the, the vehicles, families scurrying back and forth. We Iraqi army would counterattack. The next street over, ISIS, and you have to crawl up the windows and they're shooting back and forth. And then they push ISIS back. Families come back out and we feed them. Karen, you guys have obviously received criticism from people about having your children so close to the danger area. How do you explain it to people? I did know that... I wanted to support Dave's vision. I decided not to get my own teaching job when we started our ministry and to work together. And then within that, we had kids. I wanted to be a mom and bring our family into that and really help me express myself in ways that I wouldn't have been able to before. It brought me more conversations with the ladies that previously had been kind of awkward and difficult. And now we had kids to talk about. So it really was a blessing in a way I didn't even expect that brought more abundance into just the ministry that we had, first of all. And then as things got more risky or you could say tenuous, I really had a conviction in my heart to put as much eternal stuff in kids as I could. I I don't know when my last day is. I don't know when their last day is. And to pursue heaven as much as possible, to focus on, again, the eternal. The Korean people in the early years are just outstanding and amazing. They're regular people and they have faults as well. But Just the amazing things they taught me as an adult uh, about generosity and hospitality and compassion and living simply and just overall love was something I didn't want to deprive my kids of. I thought they're going to learn so much more from these uncle and aunts than I can even teach them in this situation. So people would say to me, there's a war and it's dangerous. And I'd say, but there's so many amazing things. How I couldn't do any of this better than my uncles and aunts in current state could. So I want to put them in that environment. This is actually a good thing. This is a blessing for my kids that I can't even give them. So y'all have used a term. It's a term that's interesting to Earl and I, because of course we grew up as missionary kids, but they this term missionary. I was with some uh, two friends of mine last night, Ace and Zane, and we were talking about we were talking about race first of all, um, because they're both black and I'm I'm white, and I'm, we're just talking about the idea of race. But then we get I got onto the topic of the film because they had gone with me to see it, and Ace brought up the point that he was super inspired by the film, thought the content was amazing, but he struggles with this idea of a missionary. I was talking to my wife about it this morning. She goes, well, it's because the way they do their work is their work is to help others first. And then it feels like you just live out your faith when that happens. So, but I'd love either of your perspective on that critique. I think that, you know, the, the word missionary, it means you're, you're going on a mission. What mission? And for us, it's to be followers of Jesus, obedient to his call and our personal life and our outward life. And then to be his ambassadors wherever he sends us. When I first met General Mustafa, he said, we came to a firefight to get to him. And he goes, how did you get here and who sent you? I said, God, God sent us. And he believed me, he looked at me. That's what I love about the, the Muslims in Iraq. They believe you when you say that. Oh, how'd you know? And so we, all, we share with just about everybody we can, whatever God tells us to share. We try to listen, God, what do I say right now? What do I do? Sometimes you don't say anything. Sometimes you're treating wounded and giving out food and hugging people or taking a photo. Other times, there is, you have time to talk and you say, Jesus is the answer to every problem. That's what I found. You guys' experience after the movie, uh, invariably people would say, wow, I feel like I have not done anything close to what this family is doing. So you've heard that, you know, that your experience seems 
unattainable to most Christians, I guess, uh, or the sacrifice seems uh, from afar much greater than what they have in a quote, normal life. What do you tell people, you know, again, about what they can do or how they can plug in uh, wherever they are? How do you view that? Every, every one of us all the time should say, Lord, take my life. Thank you for everything you've given. I give it back. What do you want me to do? And either God will say, you're doing what I told you to do. Now, follow me closer in it. Let's say I'm working at Apple. Follow me closer in it and put me first. You're your coworkers second, everyone else third, and you last, and watch what happens. Or he'll say, nope, you're settling. You don't need to work in that job. I got something else for you to do. And God has made every one of us different and unique. The, the whole body, the human body, and the body of Christ needs every part. A kingdom, God's kingdom needs every part from the, the doctor, the soldier, the teacher, the priest, the, the street sweeper, the engineer, the filmmakers, the photographers, the artists, everyone is part of either adding to the beauty of God's world or taking away from it. And in terms of the life we lead, I'm just, I'm grateful because I love it. I don't feel like it's a sacrifice at all. I've got a good friend who supports us a lot and said, Dave, God has given me the talent of making money and I love it. And I love my job and I make a lot of money. And then I get to give it away whoever I want to. That's cool. So everyone is needed. And in terms of those interested in three Brimmer Rangers, I think ask God, one, should you be interested? Should you pray for us? Or is there something else God wants you to pray or, or some other people God wants you to help? Second thing is you can donate funds because that's how we physically help people. Third, you can contact your representatives. When the U.S., for example, breaks a promise to the Kurds and leaves them knowing the Turks will attack and 200,000 are displaced, including all the Christians in the area. And they say, why did you betray us? We need people to talk to representatives and say, America, we can do better than that. We can do another way. We, we can be friends with the Turks and the Kurds. We don't have to choose one side. We stand in the middle, not because America can solve all the problems, but because our presence helps other people solve problems. It is absolutely our pleasure to you know, know you guys. And again, Dave, to just see what your parents really kind of brought forth because looking at 14 year old David Eubank and where he's at now I still think about what the role is of the parents that you have and how that really influenced you and your sisters and you know the work that all of you kids are doing as well and then thinking about it from Karen what you guys have done and where your kids are going to go as well I think it's it is a blessing. International School of Bangkok brother and friend uh, thank you guys for taking this time. And Karen, we have gotten to know and love you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I wish I was part of your cool ISB team, but I guess I'll just be a wannabe. Uh. This episode of Philanthropology has been made possible by Advanced Micro Devices. AMD, they're in our tribe of do-gooders, and we're excited to have them along on this journey of doing good in the world. AMD is helping solve the world's toughest and most interesting challenges around climate action, quality education and good health and well-being. Tomorrow's breakthroughs start with the determination and inspiration of today. Trust us, if you're going to do good, you need some smart people in your tribe. <laughs> yeah, people smarter than you and me for sure. So there's a lot of good that's out there that takes an influx of cash in many of these philanthropic products. And so my question's always been, does yeah. money matter? Is this, it well, good? This, yeah. So, I mean, there are obviously um, negative effects that happen when you put a lot of money in the mix. Well, that's the topic of our next episode. So the next episode is going to be all around this idea of no money, no mission. <laughs> I like it. The Philanthropology Podcast is recorded at In Your Ear Studios in Richmond, Virginia. With direction from producer Carlos Chafin, engineering help from Andrea Steffel, soon to be Bukite. Earl and I also get creative direction from Andy Dunsing, the Good Road Public Television Show. The theme music for Philanthropology was created by Jordan Martin of the band Door Mountain and can be found on iTunes. We also want to thank all of our do-gooders who gave us their time, support, and gray matter. And finally, we want to thank our original investors in all of this, our wives and kids. Specifically, our wives who put up with us, Pam Bridges and Erica Martin. And to all the girls I've loved before. <laughs> <laughs>
best parts of doing a podcast is hearing back from you all, all of our listeners. So we get feedback on what we're doing, and some of it's good, and some of it's bad. <laughs> yeah, let's start with one of the really negative ones that we just kind of had to chuckle about. So, quote, watching the trailer is a total turnoff. Looks like BS about two old white men. I feel sorry for the actual do-gooders on the ground that got roped into this show. These guys are repugnant. Uh. Okay, Beavis. <laughs> Another listener says, I don't know how anyone can be critical of this podcast unless they're cold-hearted and uncaring. Wow. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that's true. There's a lot of uh, benefit with negative critique, but yeah. we love the comment anyway. Yeah. So please, you know, go out, read our comments. And if you have the same comments, you know, put them in there. This is one of my favorites because it's at the heart of what Craig and I are trying to accomplish. I absolutely love to hear about the amazing, wonderful things that are happening around the world and meeting the people who are generous enough to give to them and make a difference in so many lives. That's awesome. So keep the comments coming. We love your ideas and your perspective. Yeah, check out the podcast wherever you get your podcasts and read the crazy reviews that are coming up. (laughs) For sure.